what I hear is I hear you're telling us that you practice acceptance. Trying. Uh, you, you might not like that a relationship ends, but by accepting it and grieving it, you open up the possibility for for another good thing. And from Puerto Rico, Brenda Jamas. Hello, hola. From Atlanta, the rolling hills of Georgia, <laughs> Tanya Carter. The red clay hills, but hello. <laughs> those don't look red. I mean, I'm colorblind, but I'm pretty sure those are not red. <laughs> And coming back, um, our first guest to do a double, Linda Vida. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Linda, for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. (laughs) Linda is back because we are still exploring this whole concept that Brenda brought up in the in December on a couple of occasions, but also on the top three tips episode, the bonus episode about how do you set yourself up for success in 2022? And here we are, we're already in the month of February. It is the love month, right? Because Ooh. here we come, we're staring Valentine's Day straight in the face, straight in the chocolates. And <laughs> what are you doing to sort of be in the right personal space to let somebody in if you don't already have somebody there. And if you already have somebody there, are you doing things consciously or unconsciously because you haven't healed? So that's the discussion for this episode too. And it may get a little deep today because that's the kind of work that Linda helps her clients do. So Linda, before we jump in, once again, describe to people what it is you do. um, How is it sort of reach certain limits because you're not a clinical psychologist, but you work with clinical psychologists if people both need your work and maybe some deeper work. So why don't you go over that first? Well, thank you. Um, I'm so glad to be back with you guys. Thank you for having me. Um, oh, you're going to be back again and again and again. I realize that. You're <laughs> and stuck psycholo- with us. <laughs> psychologist is way above my pay grade. Um, I am a professional coach. So I graduated from the Institute for Excellence in Professional Coaching. Okay. Um, and I also am a pastoral care specialist. And then I did additional work with the Gottman Institute for making coupleships work and also for uh, partner betrayal trauma. So I work a lot with people who have experienced relational trauma. And a lot of my clients are currently in therapy. And then I help work on other aspects of what's going on for them. Maybe it's understanding and implementing what they're learning about themselves and what they want to change in therapy. And then some people just enjoy coaching. So, you know, not every situation is so dark or deep. Sometimes we just want a little boost to get unstuck or to grow. So I kind of do all of that. You, we can find you where on the Internet? Sure. My business is onebraverlife.com. And you just launched a beautiful Parallax website. I was admiring it oh, the other day. It's gorgeous. Oh, yes. <laughs> that was nice. <laughs> thank you yeah. so much. So thank you. You can also find Linda on social media. Yes, on Instagram, One Braver Life. Mm-hmm. And then also I have a business page on Facebook, One Braver Life Coaching. Right. So if anybody here is listening and, you know, she does operate remotely. So if you are not in the general geography that Linda lives in, no, she can still work with you. So please contact her at any time through any of those channels and she'd be happy to set up an appointment. So Linda, we left off in the last episode. um, We were talking quite intensely about our own personal experiences with dating partners. Um, And one of the things that struck me in the conversation, and I actually posted about it on my private Facebook page, uh, my personal Facebook page this week, and I got a couple of reactions from people. It was, it definitely touched a nerve is this concept that sometimes we're not even aware of what we are projecting out to the universe and whether we're in a relationship with an individual who's trying to interpret it, or as Brenda has positioned it um, since December, how you're projecting yourself through your profile and your online app, through those first couple of chats, when someone says they like you on Bumble or Match.com. In your experience, You know, is there a balance of people who are conscious of what they're saying and doing and people who may not even be aware of it? 
Oh yeah, definitely. I, I think definitely. Um, and, and, you know, that varies so much by individual, like Richard, something I know about you that you've shared, really all of you sh have shared and been so open about being growing people. Well, not everybody wants to grow, right? So our level of true awareness is really related to how curious we're able to be and how much we can sort of look at ourselves without judging ourselves. And not everybody wants to do that or can do that. And in fact, I'm sure myself, I have things about myself. I call it peeling the onion. You know, I just want to be a growing yeah. person the entire time I'm here on earth. And um, yeah, I, I think that's just the normal part of the human experience. So Brenda and Tanya are both nodding their heads. Um, guys, um, from your side of the gender, <laughs> Do you find that men are self-aware of a lot of these things? Do you have those kinds of conversations where you're pointing something out and the guy volunteers? Wait a second. Where did, where did that come from? You're right. Um, how often does that happen for women that you feel like men are conscious of what they're saying and doing? I'm not for expecting. Me, yeah. if, I, if the guy is a friend and there is no dating there's no sex. He's look like my good bro. And, and the guards are down and he can just say this. Yeah. I've had some several male friends over the years who would say, I can say things to you that I cannot say to my wife, my girlfriend, my whoever. And I don't think it's because a wife or girlfriend is not receptive. I think it's more them guard, you know, guarding themselves and some of their emotions because they don't want to put all of it on the table and be so vulnerable. That's just my psych 101 class <laughs> coming out, you know. That, Thank you, that Freud. Really, that <laughs> resonates so much what you're saying, Tanya, because I think we, I, I don't know, that goes to the idea of gender roles. I don't know if that resonates with you ladies. Like yeah. one thing I've had to sort of clean house in my own life is the idea, you know, we, we say we want men to be vulnerable but we can be really threatened as women when a man displays vulnerability or cries or does something that we would stereotypically cast as weak, right? Like we, we want the manly yeah. man, but also the vulnerable man. And, and I think men are a lot of times, especially if our generation are conditioned to, to not be so open with that stuff. Reminds me of the Brene Brown story. She tells that story all the time about being, I think maybe her husband and her were going for marriage therapy and she said something and she said this publicly on many occasions. And she said, um, I think it's actually in one of her books as well. She said to the therapist, well, I just wish he would share more of his feelings. And he looked at her and he said, are you really ready for me to are you the therapist, the clinical researcher on relationships? Are you really ready for me to be vulnerable? He said, because I've seen instances where it seemed to get a different reaction out of you that you weren't necessarily comfortable with me being vulnerable. I just find that it's been true in my own experience, right? Be careful what you ask for because you might get it. And I come from a generation of women. I'm going to be 57 uh, in March. And I come from a generation in August. Yeah. <laughs> so I come from a generation of women. You know, I grew up with um, he's going to take care of you. And and so there was so much I had to unlearn in order to have the capacity to be healthy in a relationship. Yeah. And, and how much of that, Linda, do you look back now and say, I was operating unconsciously. I was just, I was just kind of doing it because it was the way I was taught. Or, or were you aware at the time? Oh my God, look at what I just said or did. Boy, I've got to step back and 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 correct that. I don't know about you folks, but I didn't get that till my forties or fifties. <laughs> yeah. Right when you're in your twenties, you're just having fun. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so guys, I asked Linda to ponder a question and, and I'm going to put it from my own perspective. Um, because this is always one of the things that I've struggled with as a dating 
person is sometimes um, I look at my own reactions and the reactions and words of these dating prospects. And I wonder how much of the truth of what they were saying and doing, I have converted into something different in my head because of my life's experiences. Mm. So someone may, you know, a, a, a woman in my case, a woman would say something. And instead of me saying, I'll take an example, a woman who I buy flowers for. And I thought that when I brought them to her, she didn't swoon that I brought flowers. And so maybe from my perspective, let's say I have esteem issues and I'm wondering, oh, my God, did I do something wrong? Does she not like flowers? Uh, uh, does she think I'm trying to be the man and she's not really looking for that? That I would come with my perspective and destroy the actual truth, which was she was just a little taken aback because she wasn't expecting them. That's all. It was just surprise. And I was asking Linda you know, as someone who tries to work with couples and, and again, not as a clinical psychologist, how much of the way we think through our biases, do we misinterpret what the other person's mm. saying and doing? Mm. And, and how much of that's because we have healing still to do? Who wants to take that? <laughs> I mean, I you. don't know. I didn't know if you want her to do a backflip for the flowers. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to fuck his flowers. Thank you. Yeah. Wait a second. I bought myself fresh so if it was so if I got you, if I got you, what was the name of that company that you like on Sunday mornings? Oh, if I got you sirloin tips and eggs oh. on Sunday morning, would you do her a backflip for that? Food is totally different. Like oh, you get okay. the whole booty dance and everything when you leave, drop my food. The sirloin tips and the eggs. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole butt clapping dance there. But I mean, the flowers, you're going to say thank you and give you a hug. Uh -huh. And I, because it's a it's a nice gesture. Uh -huh. But what did I guess my question to you is, what did you expect her to do? Uh, well, Maybe I'm giving a, I'm not giving a personal high. example. I have not had that. experience. No, no I'm just saying. Yeah. As you said, it was going to be obtrusive. What do you think right. the man would have expected? I don't know. You know, I guess I could see a scenario where. A man thinks that her love language includes acts mm. of whatever. And here he does. He completes the act. Yeah. And he didn't get the response. And now he's a little confused and wondering, maybe I've totally misread this lady or something. I don't know. Maybe Go I should it. have asked before I did it. Right. Mm. Like it's, you can't you can't be aware. You can't expect. How, how, do, how do I phrase? Hold on. My Spanglish is coming through. How can I expect you to be aware of something when I'm not even aware of it myself? Right. Like in order for you to to be to bring it back to the initial um, subject. Right. Like if you are working in your spirit, spirituality and your emotional health. This other person can't recognize that unless they're doing the work. I feel like they're not doing the work themselves. If they're totally, they've never broached the subject, if they never sat there to think about their healing, how can you expect them to acknowledge your healing or to pause and think about your healing and the effects of, you know, cause and effect of past trauma, right? Like they're not aware. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. I think it was just a lack of communication. She could have really liked the flowers. And because you were expecting more, and by you is whoever the man is, was expecting more. He her he didn't recognize her thankfulness, her gratefulness that we're gonna go ungrateful. He didn't recognize how grateful she was because she gave her sincere response. Not well, the since not the response and, that he expected her and to just, give. And just to go a little bit deeper on that. She doesn't know that maybe you have a past trauma around. Right. Right. That, that my ex-wife never appreciated bringing flowers. Exactly. Right. Exactly. She doesn't know this. So now your reaction, you're kind of a little disappointed and she's confused because she's like, I'm not sure what the expectation was because she wasn't aware of it. Right. Um, and see, in my world, we just start a whole argument. <laughs> right. Because right? I'm like, right. why are you tripping? I mean, damn. You spent $15 right. on these flowers. What you want me to do? 
<laughs> Wait a second. Like, they were twenty nine ninety nine. dollars All right. Oh, you know what? So here's me. because are not grocery store flowers, Tanya. I'm going to get my wallet out and give you 39 because I want to make sure you got all your money back. So when I give you your flowers on the way out the door, so, you understand. <laughs> to include like your gas money. money. I got to unplug. Yes, exactly. I Do I get the vase too or did you put it back in the plastic? have a whole argument going. I'm just like watching all three of you. So, so is it all right if I share an observation? Is that okay? Too? Yes, go ahead. Okay. I guess the way I look at it is we all have a pair of glasses. You know, that's the way we see the world. Mm. And that's our personality, our lived experiences, how we've been conditioned by the culture. And a lot of times our thoughts and feelings and behaviors, that's just decades of conditioning. And it takes time to unpack that stuff. And we want to be careful not to pathologize it, right? Like, everybody's got something. And, and so um, I call it our Whoville. So your Whoville is your rules of life for the way the universe operates and the way romantic relationships operate. So Rich, if you have one Whoville and, and the person you're dating has a different Whoville. It's up on Mount can... Crumpet. <laughs> there we go. She's the Grinch. You can have, oh my gosh, you, there's a whole field there for exploration, right? And it doesn't have to be pathological. It can just be the fun of getting to discover who one another is. Yes. So, and only you know what the deal breakers are for you. And, and so um, it's kind of like the, the way the universe works. Like some people have an issue if they've been hurt in the past, their trauma leads them to believe, you know, all men are crummy or all women are crummy or why bother? I'm just going to get hurt. And that's what good coaching can do is help you identify which thoughts where you're tripping over yourself. If you truly have trauma, you know, are you, that's, in your nervous system that's encoded in your brain and in your nervous system and you're going to need more help than what i'm able to provide because you need someone who can help you recondition your nervous system so but there you know that's there's a lot that you you can learn um about yourself just what are your rules you're operating with in the world what's your whoville <laughs> It's it, when I when I hear you guys say these kinds of things, because um, I'm a linear thinker. And and to me, if I want to get to what Brenda said, uh, Tanya said, it's all about communication. I start working. I reverse engineer it because I guess even though I'm not an engineer, my brain works that way. OK, but to communicate clearly and honestly, what does that require? It requires trust. Um what is, how do you build trust? Well, you're going to have to take some risks and open up and be vulnerable, you know? And it's like all of these interim steps that are maybe happening simultaneously and maybe you're slipping back on one, but moving forward on the other, it just always feels so complicated to me, Linda, of getting to Tanya's point of, well, so much of it's about communication. Is there one like important step that helps build the trust, helps build the vulnerability, helps build all of those other things so that you can even start walking that path to communication. Tune in to episode two of season two for Linda White's answer and so much more.